All right. So uh, that, that obviously has been a triumphant year for me, but the truth is uh, this whole story starts for me not uh, on a mountaintop or near uh, an icy cold place, but actually uh, with a fire. Uh, this is Koh Tao, Thailand, 2008. I uh, had recently graduated from Yale University with an economics degree. Thought I was going to be a finance guy and uh, decided to take a trip around the world to kind of spread my wings before settling into that path. And um, this, this looked like this was a really good idea, which was uh, jumping a flaming jump rope. Um, obviously, in hindsight, not a great idea. Um, but I unfortunately lit my entire body on fire up to my neck um, and landed in a hospital pretty, pretty injured. Um, so I was on this, on this tiny little uh, beach in Koh Tao, a small island there. The flames, the rope wrapped around my legs, flames lit my neck on fire up. Lit, flames lit me on fire up to my neck, and I had to jump into the ocean uh, to put out the flames to save my life. Um, fortunately, my clothes that I was wearing burnt, but didn't burn my skin, but not before about 25% of my body was severely burned. Um, I'll, I'll let you look at that just briefly. That's what my legs looked like, and that was about two months after the burns. Um, won't make you make, look at that for too long. Um, but needless to say, it was a very scary moment for me. Um, I was taken on a moped, driven down a dirt path to this tiny little hut that was, you know, that's a quarter the size of this room, and that was their hospital on this island. Uh, and then they said, you have to be here for 12 hours, and there might be a, a boat that can pick you up and drive you to this other island um, where they can you know, undergo surgery. So that all happened, and I underwent eight surgeries in this smaller little hospital um, where every day I came out um, in the ICU, and there was literally a cat running around my bed uh, in the hospital. So not exactly the place that you want to have uh, an accident and undergo that amount of surgeries. Um, but the scariest thing, despite all the pain, was that the doctors started to tell me, they said, hey, you know what, we just got to be honest with you, you're probably never going to walk again normally. Um, and the reason for that diagnosis is with burn injuries, not something I am very familiar with, but the scar tissue can be very thick and it can you know, penetrate into your ligaments. And I had been burned so badly over both knee joints, both ankle joints, that they figured you know, you'll be lucky to kind of just get back on your feet again. Um, and I've been an athlete my entire life, uh, soccer player and swimmer, ended up swimming in college. Um, and so I think to any person of any age being told that is horrible diagnosis. Certainly a young 22-year-old kid who feels like he has a whole life in front of him being told that was a very, very hard uh, reality, to say the least. Um, but uh, I, I think I had an angel out there, which was in the, uh, which was my mother, who flew over to Thailand and sat by my bedside, and she spent uh, the next couple of months with me in the hospital, uh, sitting by my bedside. And I know now that what she was doing was she was crying in the hallways, so scared as a mother, seeing her son in this place. But she kind of bestowed so much positivity. Every time she was in my hospital room, she's like, you know, how are you feeling? Let's, let's start talking about the future. You know, like, we're well, going to get through this. Let's make you through this. She was telling me aphorisms like, if you can dream it, you can do it. Like, what are your dreams like for the future? Um, and to be honest, I was, you know, in a pretty dark place. You know, I was scared. I was in a lot of pain. And I said, all right, I'll play along. So we started kind of talking about different ideas, things that I could sort of fixate my mind on. And I said, well... You know, I've always one day wanted to do a triathlon. So I'd been a swimmer, but I'd never biked or run competitively. Um, I'm not exactly sure how we got on this idea, but that was it. For me, I was like, that's my goal. I'm going to prove this diagnosis wrong, prove that I can only walk again, but that I can run and that I can thrive. And so not long after this, I actually had the, excuse me, um, Thai doctor who thought this was hilarious bring in some weights. I was like, all right, I can't move my legs at all, but like I need to start working out. I'm going to do this triathlon one day. He was like, all right, kid, like, sure. Um, so he brought these in. I started, you know, working out my arms, working towards this goal. Um, it was two months before I flew back to the United States, uh, at which point I still hadn't taken a single step. I was uh, carried onto the plane. I was in a wheelchair taken off of the plane. Um, and it was uh, a pretty harsh situation. And so I got back um, to my house in Portland, Oregon, and my mom said to me, she said, all right, well, you want to do this triathlon one day. That's great. But what you really need to do is figure out how to take a single step. And so I was in this wheelchair in my kitchen, my house that I grew up in, and my mom set one chair in front of me. And she said, all right, well, your big goal for today is over the course of the day, figure out how to get out of your wheelchair and stand in this one chair. It took me three hours that day to actually figure out how to do this with a lot of pain, a lot of trials and tribulations. The next day, she moved the chair five steps away. The next day, it was 10 steps. I remember celebrating the moment when I could go from the couch in the living room to the kitchen table for dinner. And it went on and on like that for about a year. 
Um, but I still kept this triathlon goal in my mind. I was like, that's what I'm going to do. So um, about a year had gone by. Like I said, this is me about five years old diving in for one of my ever first, first ever swim races. Um, and I decided, okay, well, I can at least swim. You know, my legs still can't really handle the running or cycling yet, but I know how to swim, and that's not so weight-bearing on my legs. So got into that um, and moved to Chicago. You know, it's kind of a reality hit where I kind of needed a job, kind of getting on with my life. So I started a job as a commodities trader in Chicago and started training for this triathlon. And 18 months after my in injury, I signed up for the Chicago Triathlon, um, which uh, was my first race ever. And um, I you know, got to the start line, dove in, swam, biked and run. It was a mile swim, 25 miles biking, and 6.2 miles running, which is Olympic distance triathlon. Um, and when I got to the finish line, the way triathlon works, there's some people who have raced some triathlons in here, I imagine, one or two, yeah, all right. Well, triathlons, especially a big city race like this where there's thousands of people, you get started in different waves. So about 100 people start at a, at a time. And so I finished the race, and that had been my goal. I was so happy. I was like, I can walk again. I can thrive again. I've set my goal. I went to collect my bike, came back to the finish area to look up the results. And I was pretty surprised when this is what I saw, which was that I had actually won the entire race, beating 4,000 other participants um, on the day, um, which was a pretty crazy, surreal moment for me. Um, and honestly, I was completely surprised. Um, and so this kind of set my life off in a completely different trajectory, knowing that I could over, not only just overcome this setback, but that I could thrive and that I could be an athlete again and perform at a very high level. So just at that time, someone who I'd met in the financial industry said, hey, you know, I'd like to support you and be your first sponsor if this is something you want to do. So I said, well, oh, childhood dream to be a professional athlete, so sure, why not? So I quit my, quit my desk job and uh, spent the next six years um, racing as a professional triathlete. Um, John O'Neill, who is one of the people working for the Vail Symposium, some of you might know, that's how I met him actually, racing professional triathlon um, all over the world. Um, but over the next six years, I raced in 25 countries, six different continents representing the United States. Um, this is in Australia, uh, here in Brazil, um, and another race here in South Carolina in 2014, uh, half Ironman race that I had won then. And uh, needless to say, it was an incredible experience um, being able to represent my country, to be a professional athlete, um, see so much of the world. It was an absolute privilege, especially since what I'd undergone. Um, but in 2014, right around the same time this photo was taken, um, I was kind of getting to a place where I thought, you know, this has been great. I've lived out this sort of boyhood dream of being a professional athlete. Um, but I also felt that at some point it was becoming pretty self-serving. It was sort of my own personal success or failure on the race course. Um, you know, keeping my sponsors happy is always important. But I thought, I wonder if there's something that I can do that continues to push my body to extremes, but that also has a larger presence and platform to it to do some good in the world. And I love this quote here, which says, unless you try to do something beyond what you've already mastered, you will never grow. So this idea of, I felt like I'd, I'd done this chapter. I was racing well, I was, had just won a race, but you know, it was time for me to sort of move on to the next thing. So right around the same time, um, you can see this photo here in the middle. Um, this is right after that other photo was taken. Uh, I got engaged to my lovely fiance, the love of my life, Jenna Bisa. She's in the back of the room. Um, I can have her stand up real quickly because she's an important part of this story. Very important part of this story. Um, as you will soon find out, um, she's more than just my fiance. She's uh, pretty much my partner in crime and everything that we do. And so we dreamed up this Beyond 7-2 world record project together. Um, both of us have a deep passion for um, inspiring kids and kids' health. Uh, my parents, uh, my dad's an organic farmer. My mother and fa uh, stepfather founded a chain of natural foods grocery stores in the Pacific Northwest. And so sort of health and healthy living has been super important to me. Um, and it makes me very sad and disappointed to see how um, the childhood obesity rates have skyrocketed in this country, tripled over the last three, uh, three decades, and it's a major problem. And so I wanted to do something in this space um, to inspire kids to just move their bodies, live healthful lives, give them an eye into the outdoors. It's, a, it's fun for me to be here in Vail speaking to all of you because I imagine by the fact that you're sitting in these chairs, you love the outdoors as well. Um, but that's not so true in some of the more urban settings that I speak in. Um, you know, school kids in big cities, you know, they don't necessarily even go to the local park two blocks from their house. So getting them to unplug from the video games and walk outside and do something is something I'm super passionate about. Um, and so that's what we sort of built this entire premise of this project around this concept. Um, which was great, and it has been very fun, like I was visiting one of the schools here today. But the truth is, Jenna and I also 
um, realized really quickly that we were starting a small business, a nonprofit, of course, but that we had no idea what we were doing. Uh, we had to raise all the money to do this project. This project was going to cost a half a million dollars just to do, and we can't write that kind of check. Um, we wanted, we needed to start a nonprofit. We needed to do a million other things, PR, media, all these things. Um, and it was just Jenna and I kind of figuring it out um, from scratch. I imagine there's some successful business people in this room, um, and this was one of our first uh, entrepreneurial ventures. Um, and so uh, after about 18 months of planning this project and uh, having about 100 or so people slam the door in our face saying, you definitely can't do this, we did secure some wonderful sponsors, which we're very grateful for, but those were very hard fought. And uh, the logistics and planning took us, like I said, almost uh, over a year um, to get to the point where we could set off uh, on this journey of Beyond 7.2. So that's kind of the setup, and that brings us to uh, almost exactly this time last year. I left on this project on December 25th, Christmas Day of last year, to fly down to Antarctica to begin this project and to hopefully set the Explorers Grand Slam world record. So I'm going to tell some stories from the actual project itself. Um, how many, any people in this room been to Antarctica? One, all right, two, I like it. Um, couple over here. More than a, a normal room. They're obviously not a place that a lot of people get to. Uh, not a place I had ever been before. I've been to the other six continents previously, but never to Antarctica. Um, and this is what it looks like when you land here. You arrive, they literally put you in the belly of this cargo ship, essentially, or cargo plane, and uh, fly you down there, and you land at this huge um, runway. This runway is actually um, three miles long, because um, that's how long it takes to slow down an airplane when you're skidding on you know, frozen, solid ice. And the other thing is, is that growing up in the Pacific Northwest, I had climbed a bit. I'd been fortunate enough to climb other parts of the world um, a fair bit. Of course, this project and this undertaking was something bigger than I'd ever done before. But the one thing that I was really uncertain about was understanding how cold Antarctica is. So the average temperature on my way to the South Pole uh, was minus 40 degrees. And I knew that beforehand. But I didn't really have a context or a framework for wrapping my mind around it. And I'm working through a winter in Chicago, like that's cold, you know, like that's cold, right? But like minus 40 is a whole nother level. And so I think this photo right here exemplifies uh, how cold minus 40 is better than anything, which is this is me, um, not far from the South Pole actually. I've gotten out of my tent at night. Of course, it's 24 hours of sunlight when you're down there at that time of year. Um, and I had just boiled some water for dinner. And I took a cup of boiling water and threw it into the air and it immediately turns into ice. That's what minus 40 feels like. And so now you can imagine taking that and looking like this. So this is me on my way to the South Pole. Um, so I was crossing the last degree of latitude uh, to get to the South Pole, dragging a sled. And now this photo might look beautiful. In fact, I like looking at this photo because I think the polar plateau is incredible. But imagine that being the only thing you see for day after day after day. It's an absolute sensory deprivation. It just plays tricks on your mind. It's just like staring out of the horizon, endless white. Nothing seems to get any closer or further away. It's minus 40. You're bundled up. You know, even though I was with a couple of other people, there's no way we could really talk to one another. Um, so it's definitely an adventure to say the least. This is us uh, inside of our tent here. It was the four of us um, that went down there um, on this project. So I had various different people join me for various legs of this project. Some I did completely alone, some with friends, and these were the three that I went to the South Pole with. Um, and this shows sort of what it looks like. We'd get out of our tent in the morning and there's no standing around when it's minus 40. It's just like, go, 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 go. This time lapse is over the course of about five minutes, but as you can see, it's, you get out of the tent, everyone knows their little job that they're doing, you know, we've got to be really quickly working as a team and boom, off we go, walking. Because the only way to stay warm, even if you have the most clothes on, is to keep your body moving um, before you're in the tent. So uh, on January 10th, uh, 2016, I arrived at the South Pole, uh, a very triumphant uh, moment. And uh, regardless of what your politics are, we've all heard that Donald Trump has said that NAFTA is the worst trade agreement in the entire planet. But that's me, one Mexican, one Canadian, me an American. We made it down there. We worked together. Um, so the team NAFTA uh, made it down to the South Pole uh, successfully. Um, and uh, that was a good moment. Because the way that the world record works is that uh, the time starts when you arrive at either the first pole or the first peak. So all of this in preparation and even the beginning of the South Pole expedition was important, but now I'm officially on the clock. Um, so the next step for me, I'm not going to tell you stories from every single one of these, but I'm going to dive deeper on a couple of the expeditions. But the next step was Mount Vincent. 
Um, this is me near the summit of Mount Vincent, and I'm smiling in this photo, um, but it's actually about minus 70 wind chill on this day. Um, it was a pretty bad day, and if you look closely here, you can see I had only taken my mask off just so I could have basically one photo of myself near there, um, and just instantly my eyebrows, my eyelashes, my eyes are just completely frozen, um, and I'm fanning a bit of a smile there to uh, uh, just take the photo off. Um, but really an incredible place, uh, Antarctica, uh, unbelievable place, a place I would love to return to someday. So next up uh, was Aconcagua, and Aconcagua is the tallest mountain in South America at 22,800 feet. It's actually also the tallest mountain outside of Asia, so outside of the Himalayas and the Karakoram. It's the tallest uh, mountain in the world. And up to this point, um, I had never been on a mountain this tall. I had been on an 8,000 meter peak uh, Manaslu in Nepal previously training, um, but we had to turn back from the summit. So this mountain was taller than any mountain I had previously climbed. Um, and what happened is I got there, my climbing partner, a guy named Henry, was bent, meant to meet me. Uh, the two of us were going to climb this mountain, but I was a week ahead of schedule. Now, of course, like I'm trying to set this world record, right? So I'm trying to stay kind of moving quickly. And so I called Henry up and I said, hey, Henry, you got to change the plans, fly here and meet me. And he was like, dude, I've got like a normal job and like, I can't just like fly there a week early. Um, so it was a no-go for him. He said, well, wait for me. And I said, you know, kind of thought with myself, Jenna's running the logistics in the background. We kind of put our heads together and decided, you know what, I'm going to try to climb this mountain alone. Um, and, you know, again, a mountain bigger than I've ever been on as well is, of course, there's a whole added weight to it. So obviously, if with a team of two, you'd be sharing a lot of the weight together, tent, fuel, that kind of thing. And so now I've got it all on my back. At this point, I think there's somewhere around 80, 90 pounds on my back. Um, so uh, it was a pretty, pretty tough. Um, so I finally, uh, Aconcagua normally takes about three weeks or so to climb. But one of the small benefits of doing these mountains as quickly as I was, was that I stay acclimatized between mountains, meaning that normally you need your body to adjust to the higher altitudes. We're at the high altitude here, so you're all very aware of this concept. But tell me, when I'm in Nebraska giving this talk, that people don't quite understand that concept. Um, but uh, so basically, the one benefit is that I'm pre-acclimatized from previous mountains. So when I come to the next mountain, I can move a little bit more quickly, assuming I'm not completely exhausted onto the next mountain. Um, so after being in Aconcagua for about five days, um, I decide to set up on my own um, for the summit. And I get very near the summit, and this is what I encounter, which is blowing winds. I'm the only person out there. I can't tell where I'm going. Um, and as you can see by this sort of head nod here that I decide to kind of, I have no choice but to turn back. Um, and that's mountains for you. I mean, that's mountaineering. Um, there's not many mountaineers you ever meet that have never turned back from a mountain. I've turned back from many. Um, but it's tough, of course, when you're going for a record like this, you're trying to go quickly. I've taken this risk to climb this mountain alone. My partner could have, you know, met me by this point, And I've had to basically start back from the very beginning. So I climb back down to base camp, kind of tail between my legs, and wait for another weather window. Um, a few days later, um, I do manage to get to the summit of Aconcagua, and I'm going to share this video with you next of me reaching that moment. And for me, one of the more just uh, emotional and uh, happy and vulnerable moments of the entire project. Well, here I am, walking the last few steps to the tallest place in South America. <sighs> I'm exhausted, I'm not gonna lie. This is the tallest mountain I've ever climbed after having to turn around. cheering me on made this possible I'm a little overcome with the emotion obviously 
I did it! Woo! The tallest mountain I've ever climbed. Just goes to show anything is possible if you believe in yourself. That's just me talking in my GoPro up there, but an emotional moment to say the least. I guess I'm not, I'm not too cool to, uh, to cry and let it all out a little bit. Um, but no, for me, that's a, you know, all joking aside, that's a special moment for me because I think it's a moment where when I reflect on that, I'm looking back not on just this one climb or the amazing experience to stand on top of the tallest mountain in South America all alone and look out over all the Andes. I mean, very incredible, but also everything that's gone into it. Of course, I'm remembering, you know, being burned in this fire. I say there, I'm thinking about all the kids. There was thousands of kids that were following along this project every day on social media and engaging with us. Um, the amount of work that Jenna and I had to go in to just you know take the first step of this journey and now has a third of the way through the project and it felt like it was really happening the momentum was there um, and it's just a, a very a raw a raw uh, experience for me for sure so the plan had been to come down off Aconcagua um, and that I was going to climb uh, the next mountain that I was going to climb would be Karsten's Pyramid uh, in Indonesia um, but I was ahead of schedule still and so we decided to slot in uh, Kilimanjaro next um, of course, this was me calling home to Jenna and saying, actually, reroute my flight. I need to get from Mendoza, Argentina to Tanzania tomorrow and tell them the people over there that are working on logistics to be ready for me and then I'm going to climb this. So you get it all done. So somehow she figured that out. She's incredible, as I've mentioned many times. Um, but we get uh, to Kilimanjaro. Um, actually, Jenna and I had climbed Kilimanjaro previously. It's the only one of the seven summits that I had climbed previously. Jenna and I climbed it in 2013. Um, not a super technical climb, of course, um, but a beautiful climb nonetheless, the largest freestanding volcano uh, in the world. And normally, because it's at 19,000 feet, it usually takes you know five or six days to climb it just to give your body enough time to acclimatize. Um, and that's what Jenna and I had done in 2013. And another interesting thing about Kilimanjaro, certainly well within my reach to climb this mountain uh, by myself. However, it's in a national park and it's sort of governed by a number of rules there, one of which is you have to be climbing with a local guide on the mountain, um, which in a lot of ways is great for safety, but it's also great for creating jobs over there. So I'm, I'm actually all, all for it. Um, but so this is uh, my partner, Frank, great guy. So I decided that I wanted to try Kilimanjaro uh, a little bit differently. So as I mentioned, I was pre-acclimatized from Aconcagua. And instead of taking the normal week, I wanted to see if I could climb it in one single push, in a single day um, from the base to the summit. And so uh, Frank, I meet Frank in, at the base. And he says, yeah, we can do this. We can do it in a single day or whatever. And so we start going. And the first couple hours, um, you're at pretty low altitude. You're actually in a jungle. It's very warm. And he's keeping like a super strong pace. Like I consider myself a relatively strong climber, but I'm like super out of breath. Like this guy is like superhuman. I can't believe what's going on. I'm almost having to tell him like, hey man, we got to slow down. I'm not really sure. We take a couple water breaks, eat a little bit of food and we keep going. And then hour two goes by, hour three goes by and all of a sudden I'm starting to feel stronger and he's starting to feel a little less strong, a little less strong. So I, I keep going, I keep going four or five hours goes in and the next water break, he says, hey, can I get some of your water? And I noticed you're eating some of these or like goo chew, like little energy things can I get a couple of those and I was like yeah sure man like no worries like what did you bring and he was like oh I already ate all my food and drank all my water <laughs> and I was like what do you mean and he was like I was like we have at least another like 10 hours or so to go today and he's like kind of gives me this coy look and he's like I don't know how to say this <laughs> okay I just got to tell you um, I only brought a little bit of food and water because nobody thought that there was a chance in hell that you were going to be able to climb this in a single day. In fact, y your, your wife, or he, my fiance, and he thought my wife, um, has been calling and trying to set this up, and 30 other of our guides have all passed on this trip because they just don't think it's worth their while. I'm like, it seems like it's worth your while. I'm paying you for five days, and you're only having to work for one day. He's like, no, no, no one wants to do this. And he's like, so we have a bet going on at the hotel, and 30 people have bet against your ability to actually do this. So basically, he didn't bring enough food, didn't bring enough water, definitely thought he was going to tire me out in the first couple hours. And I was like, well, I'm still planning on doing this. Are you coming with me? Like, what are we going to do? And so luckily, I had talked enough food and water into my pack 
Um, and Frank turned out to be an awesome guy, actually. So um, after 11 hours setting out from the gate, we did uh, together reach the summit of Kilimanjaro. Um, and uh, as you can see, we didn't quite beat the sunset, but we got up there about 9 p.m. Um, and uh, it was fun. Him and I actually had a great time together, but him having to sort of like that coy look on his face admit that to me that they had been all betting against me and his job was to tire me out and make sure I returned home with the tail between my legs. Um, he was gravely disappointed when they got back to the hotel and there was like, some $1 bills being exchanged by the, by the staff there. Um, so that was a, a highlight for sure. And then moving on, um, the next uh, mountain I climbed was Karsten's Pyramid. So there's somewhat of a conflict in the um, Seven Summits community as to how you define Austria, or sorry, Australia um, continent. It's whether you define it as just Australia, the continent itself, or if you expand that to ex the tectonic plates where they originally were and where they started to move, which includes a lot of the outlying islands. Um, so if you just define it as Australia, it's a very short walk up a mountain called Kosciuszko. And if you define it more broadly, it's a much more challenging mountain, this mountain called Karsten's Pyramid. I climbed both just so that there was no controversy as to which seven summits list that I did. Um, but Kosciuszko is not particularly interesting to talk about. It's about a two hour day hike on a very normal trail. Um, so this is Karsten's Pyramid, which is a mountain uh, in West Papua, um, Indonesia, a very rural part of Indonesia, a tough place to get to. Um, and it's the one mountain of all the seven summits um, that doesn't have snow on it. Um, even Kilimanjaro has a little bit of snow at the top. Um, and it's more of a rock climbing mountain than it is sort of glacial travel, uh, mountaineering. Um, as you can see here, I'm crossing something called a Tyrrhelian Traverse, um, which is a rope rigged across a huge cavern. Um, it's about, I don't know, 1,000 or 2,000 feet dropping uh, below you at this point. Um, and although I'm smiling a little bit, just like in my Vincent photo, I like to smile in photos. I'm pretty, you know, I'm nervous at this moment, I'm not going to lie. Um, but this was a, a unique climb and a fun one, uh, to say the least. Um, and then next up was Mount Elbrus, which is the tallest mountain in Europe. Um, so very beautiful place, as you can see. Um, most of the time, you know, about 95% of the summits, if not more, of this mountain are climbed in summer. In June and July is a normal climbing season. And that's the previous record holder for the Explorers Grand Slam had done that at the very end of the project. So for me, trying to set this record, I decided, I wonder if I can do a winter ascent instead, which moves it up in the queue, and so I can finish on Denali. Um, so I'm glad that I did it this way, although it was much harder than this climb normally is. Uh, very icy, very dangerous. It's about minus 35 wind chill here. Um, as you can see, I'm completely covered up. And this actually turned out to be one of the harder climbs, believe it or not, for me um, over the course of this, just due to the winter conditions. And I was actually just the next day after me, a huge storm blew in and put about five foot of snow on the mountain and closed the climbing for about two or three weeks, which for me would have been kind of the end of my project. Um, and so I got very lucky to be able to kind of thread the needle uh, and climb this uh, winter ascent. And then that brings us to sort of the final third of the project, um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about some of these uh, experiences. But uh, the North Pole, Everest, and Denali are the final third of the project. Um, and objectively, I think, of the nine expeditions, these are the three hardest expeditions anyways. And now they are at the end of the project. I've been out here, as you can see, for over 100 days at this point, um, going nonstop. And the weather windows on all of them sort of conflict with each other. So most people start their Everest expedition in early April. People start hiking up the Kumbu Valley on about April 1st or April 2nd. I did not arrive to the North Pole until April 19th. So that's already a problem because I'm behind schedule. Now, most of you probably know this, but it's not the most intuitive thing. Of course, the North Pole is not continent. It's actually just floating sea ice in the middle of the ocean. Um, as you can see here, uh, there's actually you know, openings where you see the, see the uh, ocean right there. One of my, my partner who I was out there with actually fell through one of these cracks, and we had to pull him out, uh, warm him up to make sure that he wasn't hypothermic. It's, again, same as Antarctica, you know, minus 20, minus 30 degrees out there, very wet. And to make matters even worse, I'm delayed eight days because the, hell, or the plane that lands you out in the sea ice to begin expedition, they, the runway keeps breaking and cracks like this, and I'm at sea level. The next mountain I need to climb is Mount Everest. So it's pretty much the opposite of what you want to be happening at this time. Um, and it was definitely, I would say, one of the more emotionally uh, challenging times to be patient and kind of stay, stay the course here. So when I finally did arrive, well, actually, I should say one thing first, which is the North Pole also is a very strange place in that when you camp at night, 
the first thing you do is you wake up in the morning and you check your GPS and you either have a huge smile on your face or a frown because you've either drifted towards the pole, like, great, we're a mile closer and we're just sitting here. Or half the time you look and go like, oh shit, we gotta cover that last mile again because you're on a treadmill, it's sort of going in the wrong direction. There's no way to predict it. And the other thing that's weird is when you get to the North Pole, unlike, you know, Aconcagua or a normal mountaintop that's sort of this triumphant moment, everything looks exactly like what you've been walking through for days and days and days. And it's just your GPS looking different. You're just looking at your GPS like, all right, uh, okay, the North Pole is right here. Quick, take up, no, nope, hold on. North Pole's over here because you're just moving around. It's a very bizarre place, um, but I actually really enjoyed it. Definitely one of the more unique places on this planet and a place, unfortunately, that's changing uh, all too quickly right now. Um, so, as I mentioned, the next step was Everest, coming straight from sea level, and this is me um, just above base camp on Everest, actually near Camp 1, um, but when I was the very last person to arrive to Everest Base Camp this year, so I arrived to Everest Base Camp on April 27th, and like I mentioned before, most people are starting their climb, um, you know, about a month before that. And the other thing about Everest, uh, I know we have at least one Everest summiter in the room. Is there any other Everest summiters in the room? No, just one. Okay, that's still one. Another one? Yeah, two. We have two. All right, that's awesome. Love that. Um, and... The other thing is, is that Everest has a pretty specific summit window, meaning that even though I'm a month delayed, it's not as if I can just say, oh, great, well, then I'll, I'll summit a month after most other people are summiting. There's a, you know, there's a few days that open up, usually in the middle to third part of, uh, second third of May um, for the summit. And so I had to see if I could come straight from sea level and pack what is usually a two-month expedition in two, three weeks. Um, to make uh, matters even more challenging, and uh, it sounds like we have a pretty uh, well-versed mountaineering uh, community in this room, is that no one summited Everest in 2014. There was uh, an avalanche right here in the Kumbu Icefall that killed 16 Sherpas and closed the climbing season. And then in 2015, of course, the devastating earthquake in Nepal that closed the climbing season, but even worse, you know, killed over 10,000 people in the country. Uh, it was a very devastating time for Nepal. So you can also imagine for me, when I was trying to get people to help support this project, people were looking at me like saying like, so no one's climbed Everest in 2014. No one's climbed Everest in 2015. And you think you can climb Everest and do these eight other mountains. I'm like, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, help, come on, support me. Um, so there was uh, some convincing to be had. But this is the Kumbu Icefall, um, the lower part of the mountain from base camp to camp one. There's five camps on Everest. So you've got base camp, camp one, camp two, camp three, camp four, and then you go to the summit from camp four generally. And this is on the south side route from Nepal. There's another common route um, on the Tibetan side, on the Chinese side. Um, and <clears throat> this is what it looks like <clears throat> crossing uh, ladders uh, through the Kumbu Icefall. Um, there's many of these uh, that you cross, but this is just one that I'm crossing to give you an example of what it looks like. Um, this icefall is definitely uh, very unique and uh, hallowed ground uh, in the mountaineering community for sure. A lot of uh, triumph as well as tragedy has happened uh, across these, this place. So, even though I crossed a lot of them, I was still pretty stoked every time I got across each one of them. Um, and so the next thing is, this is a feature on the mountain above Camp 2, between Camp 2 and Camp 3, called the Loti Face. That's actually the Everest Summit Ridge up to the left. The perspective is weird because that's actually like several days walk away, even though it looks relatively close. Um, I went over there and I was climbing independently. I was just climbing with myself and one Sherpa, a guy by the name of Pasang Bodhi, who I had met climbing in Nepal uh, the year previously. Uh, most Everest expeditions are a little bit bigger than that with guides and clients and several Sherpas and that. Um, but of course, because I was trying to move quickly and had a pretty unique time frame, um, I was kind of going as light as fast as I could and just the two of us were climbing the mountain, which allowed us to be a little bit more nimble. Um, so this, <clears throat> We decided to go for the summit. Um, there was a small summit window opening up on May 15th. Um, the only problem was we were at Camp 2 and it was May 13th. So what that was going to mean is that we were going to need to go straight from Camp 2 to Camp 4 in a single push, which is normally over two days, and then go for the summit. Um, we got up between Camp 2 and Camp 4 um, feeling pretty good. As you can see, the sun is out. Um, I've switched to using supplemental oxygen at this point. Um, about 98% of Everest summits are completed with supplemental oxygen for the summit day. Um, and obviously with me being as far behind the acclimatization schedule coming from sea level, that, that was absolutely my only choice um, for this climb for sure. 
And this is a feature called the Geneva Spur, which is just before the South Call, the Camp Four. And although it had been a beautiful day of climbing and we were supposed to go for the summit that night, right as we turned this feature, we basically got caught out in a horrendous storm. All of a sudden, 50, 60 mile per hour winds kicked up. We were getting blown around. It took us two hours just to set up our tent on the South Call. And uh, imagine there's several people who have read Into Thin Air or John Krakauer's book uh, in this room, know a little bit about Everest. Um, Camp Four, in a lot of ways, is a place that many, many, many things have gone wrong in storms. Um, and that book, uh, as well as many other stories of people getting caught out here, pinned down, unable to go up, unable to go down, and um, dying. Uh, for lack of a more better way to say that. Um, so I was pretty scared in this moment, and it was pretty clear that we were not going to be able to make a summit push the night. Um, we were just happy to be able to be inside of our tent, try to sleep through the night, and escape down from this storm. And so this next video I took as we woke up the next morning after spending a pretty rough night getting pounded at Camp 4, um, and I'm descending down the mountain. Well, I have to descend now because I'm stuck in this windstorm. It's painful because it's clear sky. The summit feels like it's just right there, but we're just getting blown around way too much here. Way too dangerous to risk going all the way up to the top right now. Well, I've just come down from Camp 4 after having to turn around due to weather. Um, a lot of people, if they go to 4 and they come down, there's no going back for sure. Um, that's it for them. That's a one-way ticket. Um, but uh, yeah, not for me. Whew. Disappointing. Really, really disappointing. It appears I still have Everest, so I'm going up there soon, soon. Yeah. I don't know how convinced you guys are by that little pep talk I'm trying to give myself, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm just trying to put as positive a spin on it as I possibly can. I actually don't realize when I'm taking this video, but you can see there on my cheek a little bit of frost, beginning of frostbite starting to form from them being out in the wind um, up that high. And um, as I get back down into camp two, I realize I'm pretty exhausted. Things aren't going well. And of course, we've also started using some of our oxygen supply. So there's actually a logistical concern at this point uh, as well as to whether I can actually even make a second attempt. Um, in a small sort of twist of fate for me, another climber who I was friends with on the mountain uh, got very sick right at the same time at Camp 2. His oxygen bottles had already been carried up to South Call. Um, and he said, hey, Colin, if you can muster up enough energy to get back up there, there's some of my oxygen bottles are cached up there, and you're more than welcome to use them. So that at least gave me the window into being able to try to, again to go for the summit. Uh, a few days later, another weather window did open up. Um, again, I tried to skip from Camp 2 to Camp 4 and got caught out in a bad storm at Camp 3, so the luck just kept kind of the mountain gods kept kind of beating me down, um, but I did make it back to Camp 4, um, and this is the night of May 18th going into May 19th, um, a photo that I took just getting out from my tent at Camp 4 um, to go for this, hopefully go for the summit. Um, the thing that was pretty scary for me at the time is that the weather forecast was actually exactly the same as it had been when I had been up there four days earlier. Um, it looked like it might be all right, but that some high winds and things could blow in pretty quickly. Uh, and I saw pretty much firsthand how bad that could go being there, even though I had my tent and everything. So I could only imagine what that would probably feel like being up on this summit ridge, super exposed, and definitely getting pretty tired from all the climbing. I think it's 120 some days I've been out going uh, at this point. And so, in all honesty, I actually called home to Jenna to sort of discuss the options. And I said, you know, Jenna, I'm really scared right now. I don't really know what to do. Um, you know, if some people are going to climb, based on the weather forecast, I think people might die out there today. I definitely think there's going to be a lot of frostbite out there today. You know, what should I do? And in a, in a huge testament to Jenna, and I think it's very similar to my mother walking into my hospital room with a huge smile on her face, Jenna told me what I needed to hear, which is she said, Colin, You've trained for this. You're one day away from reaching the summit of Everest, which is a boyhood dream of yours. You know, go out there. Some people are going to summit Everest today. There's absolutely no reason you can't be one of them. Um, and we actually have video. My cousin was filming her. We actually have video of her hanging up the phone. And of course, she breaks out into tears because really what she wanted to tell me was, come off this mountain. It's not worth it. It's just a mountain. It'll be there. Um, but it's exactly what I needed to hear um, to have the courage to get out of my tent and start climbing. So 
this is the night, um, and as you can see, these are all headlamps uh, going up. Um, sort of where the headlamps stop is a feature called the balcony, uh, which is about halfway up the route um, on the summit day. And people actually started leaving for the summit around 6 or 7 p.m. Uh, it used to be people left at 2 a.m., and then it got to midnight, and now people are basically racing to be the first people up there. The reason being is that there's just one rope, a fixed rope that's been put up there that everyone else is using. Um, and unfortunately, Everest has been commercialized in a lot of ways, and there's probably some people up there climbing that probably should not be up there, but everyone is sort of in the same boat, uh, tethered to the same rope together, unfortunately. So this was actually my biggest fear, particularly in a day that was going to be windy and cold, because getting stuck standing still on a rope and not being able to move um, can spell disaster for sure. So, but I also didn't want to be the first person to leave and end up on the summit at dark. So it's kind of this weird cat and mouse uh, game. And because of this storm that had blown in three or four days previously when I had been up there, all of the climbing teams had been stacked up against each other. So even though no one had climbed in 2014, no one climbed in 2015, I somehow ended up on my summit day of Everest, the most crowded day that the mountain has seen in a very long time, uh, probably since 2012 um, when John was there. Um, so... <clears throat> I left my tent, uh, me and Pasang Bodhi set off uh, to climb, and we decided uh, the best thing for us to do was to climb this section up to the balcony unroped. So we decided to unclip from the fixed lines and climb beside the fixed lines completely unroped so that we could actually keep moving and pass a number of people. Of course, that creates some objective at risk if you were to slip and fall, um, but we felt confident over this terrain to be able to climb it unroped, and that allowed us to pass by uh, a lot of people. Um, just past the balcony, it starts to get a lot more exposed and steep, um, and I didn't feel comfortable climbing unroped at that point, so we decided we pretty much just had to kind of put our, uh, put our lots in with everyone else, clip into the, the fixed rope. I had been wearing a lighter down jacket at this point, and I decided, okay, we're going to start moving a little bit slower, and I need to put on my heaviest jacket, put on my heavier gloves, and kind of make, you know, kind of settle into this slower pace. And so as I'm doing that, I take off my gloves, adjust my jacket, and I look down, and my right hand is completely black, just black, completely black, through and through black, um, which of course is a telltale sign of severe frostbite. Um, I'm at about 28,000 feet at this point, maybe just below that. I've of course never been that high before, and it's strange to me because I just didn't notice it. I didn't feel it coming on at all. Um, the first thought was, well, I definitely, if my hands look this bad, I wonder what my feet look like. I'm, of course, not going to take off my boots to check, but I have electronic foot warmers in my boots, and so I turn those up as hot as they possibly can go. So that's the first order of business. Um, and then the second order of business is to think what I should do. So I decide not to tell Pasang Bodhi, which is not a great climbing partner thing to do. Um, of course, if he had told me this, we would have immediately turned down uh, and gone down the mountain. It's not worth it. Um, I kind of go into this negative headspace, thinking, what should I do? Should I keep going? Should I stop? Should I go back? Um, is Jenna still going to love me if I come home without a right hand? Um, but I decided, you know, maybe she's going to love me if, even though clearly I'm going to lose my right hand, but maybe she'll love me if I've at least summited Everest and lost my right hand rather than not summited Everest. That's a very twisted way of thinking, of course, um, but that's where my head was at at that moment. So I continued onward. Um, and this is what it looks like. This is actually not on the summit day. This is on the low T face, but this is what it looks like being on a fixed line um, stuck behind a bunch of people. Um, you know, when I said I was passing people on my way up the balcony, I was walking at some sort of pace, it's kind of like this, and that's kind of like sprinting past people up there, you know? Um, so it's relatively fast is a very relative term when you're talking about an 8,000 meter peak like Everest. Um, but I kept going. <clears throat> and uh, we get uh, nearer to the summit, uh, approaching the Hillary Step and the Cornish Traverse, which is sort of the very last famous feature on the south side route. Um, and this is what it looks like. Kind of just drops off on either side pretty significantly, but a really incredible view. In red, that's Pasang Bodhi who I'm climbing with, and then other climbers up there on the route.
So just after, I, I wish I had kept the tape running, but just after this, because I'm messing around with my camera, I actually have to adjust my gloves like one more time. And so I adjust my glove and I know what I'm gonna see is this horribly frostbitten hand. And I pull my glove out and then all of a sudden I start fist pumping. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And Pasang Bodhi looks back at me like, what are you doing? Like, calm down, we're not at the summit yet. It's 30 minutes this way, like what's going on? And I was like, my hand's back, my hand's back. And he's like, I never told him anything was wrong. It just so it happened that my chemical hand warmer inside of my glove, which is made up of copper filings and things, had busted open inside of my glove and dyed my hand completely black. And in the middle of the night, and with my brain not working great, I had thought it was frostbite. But fortunately, it was just dyed black from the carbon in the, the hand warmer. Um, and so, 30 minutes later, we did reach the summit of Mount Everest, and uh, uh, the elementary or the middle school kids I visited with today love this, Latin, this next clip. Um, but it's a record that I don't think I get enough credit for. But I was the, also the first person to Snapchat from the summit of Everest. <clears throat> so, um, all jokes aside, we were really trying to engage as many people as we could with this project, um, and particularly kids. And um, I didn't know at this time, but my, my Snapchat, which is the first Snapchat ever from the summit of Everest, was featured. And 22 million people around the world uh, saw this, and mostly school kids. So it actually was uh, a fun way to, to share this journey uh, with other people. Um, but standing on the summit of Everest certainly was an incredible moment for me. Um, and uh, that's a smile of relief, knowing my hand is all right, and that I've made it, and that I have just one more mountain to climb. But what any good mountaineer will tell you, of course, is that the summit is only halfway and that you got to get down, you know, get down safely uh, before you can really celebrate. And, you know, all too often, you know, 80 percent of accidents on mountains generally happen on the descent. Um, so you're a long way from safety at this point. So take a few pictures and come back down the mountain. I get back down uh, to Camp 4 and I call Jenna to tell her that I'm safe. Um, Unfortunately, she's starting to get sort of some social media updates from other teams and people that have been checking in. Um, and my call to her the night before, I had been right, um, unfortunately, which is that uh, two people died on Everest that day, same day that I was out there. Um, and a number, about 20 other people in the next 48 hours uh, got rescued from severe frostbite, hands, feet, um, really bad. The conditions were actually pretty rough um, out there on that day. Um, and I fortunately did, you know, for my own mental health, didn't really realize this as I was coming down the mountain. Um, but the reality kind of starts to sink in at that point. But I <clears throat> got back to Camp 4 and I called Jenna and I, she said, so how are you feeling? You're all right? We're getting these reports. I said, yeah, I'm fine. She's like, well, we're hearing there's a lot of frostbite. Like, are you all right? And I said, no, I'm, I'm completely fine, except for I think that I burned my feet. And she said, burned your feet? She have frostbitten feet? Like, oh my God, that's terrible. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. I turned my foot warmers up so hot because I thought my hand was frostbitten that I actually have burned two large circles in the bottoms of each of my feet. And of course, I love her. She said, you're literally the only idiot that goes and burns themselves their feet at sea level and the top of the world. Like, what is wrong with you? You and fire, like not, not good friends. Um, but uh, a small price to pay, I suppose. But the next thing she says to me is she says, well, We've done some math, we've done some calculating, and you are about two months ahead of schedule uh, for breaking the Explorers Grand Slam world record, which of course is my goal. All I have is Denali left. And I said, wow, that's fantastic. And she said, however, if you can get to the summit of Denali in the next seven or eight days, you will also break the Seven Summits world record, which is just for the peaks, not inclusive of the poles, and in a lot of ways is uh, thought to be even more prestigious than the Grand Slam. It's been sort of held by a number of very prolific mountaineers. The most recent guy who's held it has climbed Everest 10 times, Denali 65 times. You know, very legendary mountaineers have held that record. And when it's been broken, it's only been broken by a day each time over the last decade or so. It's kind of got to the, the point where it's, you know, very hard to break. And I never thought that I would have a chance to break it while also doing the pole. So it's not something that I was ever sort of thinking about. So Jenna says, so I know you're a pretty competitive guy. So I think you should go for it. And I said, well, what's that going to mean? And she said, well, the first thing I need you to do is put your boots back on and get out of your tent. And I said, what are you talking about? It literally, hyperbole aside, has taken me an hour to take off my boots, get in my sleeping bag inside of my tent. She says, no, no, no. Put your boots back on. I need you to climb back down to base camp. At base camp, there's going to be a helicopter. The helicopter is going to take you to Kathmandu. 
You don't have enough time to stay in a hotel overnight in Kathmandu, but there's a flight that's going to take you to Dubai, Seattle, then Anchorage, and then we're going to need to get you out to the lower glacier on Denali for you to start climbing. That'll give you about three or four days. I know it normally takes three weeks to climb Denali, but three or four days. If you can get up to the summit then, then you'll also break the southern world record. So put the boots back on, get going. <laughs> um, so needless to say, of course, she was right, and uh, that did inspire me to get my butt going. Um, so I, I did all of that and ended up here at the lower glacier of Denali, um, less than 100 hours from being on the summit of Everest. I was now all of a sudden on the other side of the world climbing Denali. Um, the only proper sleep I had was just in my flight, my long haul flight. You know, that was the bed that I got. Um, at least that was indoors for a second, I suppose. Um, but here's me on Denali. So on Denali, very much different than uh, Everest. Uh, as a mountain where you have to be very much so self-sufficient. There's no porters, there's no Sherpas, um, nothing like that. Um, and it's a lot of gear necessary based on how cold it is. And one of my great childhood friends, a guy named Tucker, decided to meet me uh, over on Alas in Alaska for this final climb. And he had gone over about a week ahead of time, so he would be acclimatized, knowing that I would want to move quickly. We didn't know how quickly I was going to need to move, um, but he was there, uh, thankfully. And uh, this is us hauling our gear up to uh, 14 camp, which is about halfway uh, up the climb. So we get up to 14 camp. Normally, Denali is climbed uh, on the standard route. Uh, first, you go to 14 camp, then there's a camp at 17,000 feet, and then the summit's 20,000 feet. Um, when we get to 14 camp, uh, we've got about one day to spare for the seven summits world record, or two days to spare at this point, and this is what we see. So that's me filming Tucker. Um, as you can see, we're, that's the emotions we're feeling at that moment. Um, and unfortunately, in Alaska, uh, storms generally don't just come and go quickly. They, when they come, the wind's coming straight off the Bering Sea. They usually sit there for a week or so. It's a very common story on Denali for people to sit in their tents for a week or even two weeks, just getting hammered by storms. And this storm was no different. As we checked the forecast, it looked like that storm was going to sit there for at least a week, uh, looking like that. Uh, the ranger station at 14 camp recorded 80 mile per hour winds that night, which was the highest they'd recorded in the entire season. And so obviously we're at this point we're pretty distraught. So we sit back down that night over dinner and Tucker says, well, what do you think? What do you want to do? And me and my sort of eternal optimism is like, well, you know, you never know. Maybe we're going to get a shot. Um, keep in mind, we're still, you know, not even in the closest camp to the summit. We're, you know, two camps below at this point. And I just decided to say like, well, let's go to sleep. We'll wake up in the morning, sort of see how the weather's doing, how we're feeling, and maybe, you know, somehow we'll be able to go for the summit. And so this is me waking up the following morning in my tent uh, alone. Tucker's in the next tent beside me. Just waking up here, Denali. Uh, thinking about maybe going for the summit. I think the... Uh, Winds have died down a little compared to what they were, but still blowing. I'm practically buried here in my tent. Snow everywhere. So, we'll see. Um, and then I get out of my tent and it looks like this. Needless to say, not exactly what I was hoping for. So, decision time. Um, you know, Tucker and I again sit down in our cook tent and sort of discuss our options. And he said, "Hey, I'm here for you. What do you want to do?" And I said, "Well, like, what do you think is possible? What do you think we can do?" And um, I, for one. I've always lived by this quote, I love this quote, which says, he who says he can and he who says he can't are usually both right. Um, for me, I said, well, what can we do? And I, he was like, I was like, can we climb 15 minutes towards the summit? And he was like, yeah, man, we can put on all our gear and climb 15 minutes for the summit. I was like, let's see how that goes, and then we'll reevaluate. So we gear completely up as if we're going for the summit, as if we're leaving for the summit. We hike 15 minutes out of camp. As actually, as we're leaving camp, a guy unzips his tent um, from another team, put, pokes his head out, and he says, oh yeah, this storm's brutal, you guys are bailing off this mountain, we're thinking about doing the same thing. And we're like, no, 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 we're going for the summit. 
He was like, get back in your tent. No one's climbing today. Like, you guys are crazy. Um, but obviously, we decide to climb. We go for 15 minutes. We go for 30 minutes. In the, in the first 30 minutes, we actually get blown off of our feet a couple of times. It's blowing so hard. Um, pretty rough conditions. Um, but the one saving grace is that actually the clouds clear, and so the visibility is looking somewhat like this. So at least we can see where we're going, but the wind never abates. Uh, about halfway up the climb, this happens, which is the same pants that I've been wearing and climbing in many days. The zipper completely rips um, off of them from the wind blowing so hard. And now Tucker is kind of piecing back my pants with a couple of ski straps he happened to have in his backpack. We tried duct tape, but it's too cold. Um, the wind chill, I'm told, on this day is about minus 60 degrees um, with how cold it is. And of course, again, we're very worried about our fingers and toes, so we keep sort of checking in with each other, uh, you know, minute to minute. We actually get to the base of uh, there's sort of one last big uh, uphill on the main, on the West Busters route of Denali called Pig Hill. And Tucker, who's climbed Denali before, I've never been there, starts fist pumping. And he's fist pumping because he thinks that we're going to make the summit. And the only thing that I can think of in my mind is how does he have enough energy to fist pump anything right now? I'm like completely on my last, last legs, having just been on Everest, you know, a few days before. Um, but on May 27th, um, after 12 hours or nine, I don't remember, nine or 10 hours climbing from 14 camp, um, we made it to the summit of Denali and my eventual finish line, which is the summit marker here um, in Alaska. Woo! I'm a world record holder! Two times! So it's quiet on this part, but I'll talk over it. Um, obviously, a really incredible moment for me to sort of have just not broke one, but two world records. But you can see the look in my eyes here. It's, I'm not sure it's celebration, more just exhaustion and relief um, to be somehow finished with this crazy project after 139 days out there. Um, I ended up breaking the Explorer's Grand Slam record by nearly two months. Um, and then I broke the Seven Summits record by about 36 hours, uh, about two days. Um, so just in the nick of time. Uh, to get that done, which certainly um, has been, uh, needless to say, a very incredible journey for myself. Um, but really the metric for me was, you know, how is this going to resonate with others, particularly with the kids that we were hoping to inspire. Uh, Jenna had been working so hard in the background, but I had been so focused on the climbing day to day that I really didn't know exactly what was going on sort of outwardly. Um, it was incredible to come home to find out that we'd been gotten coverage in, you know, all sorts of press, you know, 80 million um, earned media impressions, um, which w was great. Um, what, to me, what was even more amazing was the amount of different people that connected with this story. Uh, this was never a um, story about me doing some crazy thing that no one's trying to do. I've always tried to create a very inclusive and universal message around what I do, particularly with the kids, just inspiring them to set their own goals, go out there, be bold, um, challenge themselves in any way they can see fit. And so for me, the charitable mission behind this project is what lives on and what I am most proud of um, and the amount of kids that have connected with it um, during it and the amount that we've been able to do even more. Actually, in January, I'm speaking to 15 elementary schools in the De Denver area, and we continue to do this work, um, outreach work, all around the country, um, and that's uh, really important to me. And so the last thing that I'll leave you with is sort of what we do when, we talk, when I talk to the kids. One of the great one of the many great things that Jenna dreamed up during the course of the project was to ask these kids who are following along this project, what's your Everest? Ask them, what is the big goal that they have in their lives that they're pushing for us? And to send us video clips of it. And it's been incredible, the responses we've gotten. Anything from, my Everest is to be the first person in my family to graduate from college. You know, my Everest is to make sure the snow leopards stay off the endangered species list. You know, my Everest is to be a gymnast like Simone Biles in the Olympics one day, so I'm going to practice super, super, super hard. Um, you know, we have thousands of these, and we continue to elicit responses like that from kids all over the place. And for me, that's the most special thing um, about this entire project is to give me an opportunity to speak on that. And I think that the message, even though you're not elementary school students, um, resonates with everyone because I know it resonates with me. Having just completed this project, I have more Everest to climb in my life. When I was sitting in the hospital bed in Thailand, my Everest was triathlon. You know, the last few years, my Everest has been this project. And I'm 31 years old. I will have many more in my life. And so going through the amount of setbacks that I've gone through in my life and realizing that you can come out 
triumphantly has been pretty incredible. And for me, the small, I carry this small rock, which is actually a rock that I took from the summit of Everest as a small reminder for me that sometimes when you're standing down at the bottom of a goal, you're looking up at Mount Everest. It's the biggest mountain in the world. It can seem pretty daunting. Or when I was in my wheelchair and I said I want to do a triathlon, just walking, taking that one step seemed pretty daunting. But if you remember that you can break those things down into the incremental day-by-day processes of just doing the one thing, taking the next step, breaking a huge mountain down to its tiniest little parts, I think that we can all achieve great things. So I encourage you to ask yourself that question of what's your Everest? Um, And the power of the human spirit is amazing. Anything we set our minds to, we can do. So thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it.